We're going to be looking this morning at 2 Samuel chapter 23. We'll begin there. Um, as we've been doing this this year, skipping through the Bible, uh, the kind of the method of our madness, as people might say, the method for figuring out what, what we're, how we're skipping is that um, I look in the, in the group of chapters that we'll be reading in the coming week. As a congregation, we are reading through the Bible. January 1st, we were in, uh, Gen- on Genesis 1, and now uh, we're in 2 Samuel. Uh, I think yesterday we started 2 Samuel, and this week we'll get to the end of 2 Samuel. And um, so uh, for myself... Or for our class, we're looking, I, I kind of just scan through the chapters that are in the group and, and look for, see if a, a particular uh, passage jumps out at me, one that I was curious about studying or one that I studied before and greatly enjoyed or, or something. A lot of, there's kind of not any method once we get inside there. I just look and if something pops out. Um, I think it would be help. It's helpful. Um, so, and but as it turns out, we wouldn't normally have Sunday school this morning. Normally, we'd be trying to get everything ready for the children's program and, and all of that type of thing. But without all those extra, um, all those extra responsibilities and activities taking place, we decided uh, for the whole church to go ahead and have a Sunday school lesson. And so, as I look through the, the chapters that we'll be reading. There was two or three uh, passages that came to mind, and then I saw this one. In fact, there's um, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, is a very important passage for uh, doctrinally. It says David is speaking. We see that. These be the last words of David in verse 1. And then in verse 2, he says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. So that's a very important uh, verse helping us understand the, the process and the product of inspiration, which, is one of the, which was a foundational doctrine for us as Christians, understanding that God's word is, is God's word, not man's words. And so David says that when he spoke, it was the Spirit of God speaking by him, and the actual words that he spoke, the actual words of God were in his tongue. But the next verse caught my eye, because it's important also, And so this morning, I would like to speak on rules for rulers, which we will begin in 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. I don't know why this verse stuck out to me at this time in our country, but it did. uh, So in verse 3, David says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So um, David says, makes this point, and there's, there's a lot of places that that statement can go, and we'll, we'll touch on some of them. But if we read from verse 1, just to get the context of it, uh, because I kind of broke it up. Verse 1 says, now these be the last words of David. Now they're probably not his very last words, but his last published words. The chapter before, he wrote, uh, uh, he writes a psalm. In fact, the psalm is very similar to one that's actually in the psalms. And then he gives these last words, and he says, David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high and anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said... The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of of Israel spoke to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun rises, and the morning without clouds. And it goes on. So David makes a point there and says, he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. Now, I, it's, I, would, I contend, and I hope that you will at least consider the point, that David, while he is the king of Israel, that that statement is a statement from God. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me, and this is what he said, he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. It's my contention 
that God says that to every ruler in the world, not just to rulers of Israel. And so I would like to take that idea and think through it somewhat. God says that if you rule over men, you must be just and you must rule in the fear of the Lord. There's some other relevant passages, and these are, um, of course, the Old Testament is the book for the Israelites. But if it was just for the Israelites, we could just leave it in Israel. We could just, you know, it could be scattered over the world like the Jews are, but the rest of us could pay no attention to it. But we don't believe that we should pay no attention to the Old Testament. It's there for us to learn from. It's the foundation of the New Testament. We wouldn't have a New Testament without an Old Testament. And so um, let's, I'm going to quickly look at a couple other passages. Well, actually, I've got a lot of verses to read, and so I hope I can just work through them quickly, but also um, make some points that we can consider uh, this week, um, and, and not just this week, but I think these, are, these passages have practical application to us. So the first one I want to refer to is Exodus chapter 18. And in Exodus chapter 18, Moses was trying to rule over all the hordes, the, the millions actually, of Israel. When they had a question, they would come to him. And his father-in-law says, you're going to kill yourself, basically. And uh, says, why don't you do this? If you do this and the Lord, and, and, he, and, and the Lord says that you should do it, you will um, save yourself self a lot of trouble. And, and so in the middle of all that, Exodus 18, verse 21, says, uh, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands. So in that verse, we see some of God's qualifications for people that should be rulers. They should be able, um, able men, and they should fear God, they should be men of truth, and they should hate covetousness. Another place uh, where Moses kind of recounts this, a lot of what happens in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers gets recounted for us in Deuteronomy, right? And so in Deuteronomy 1, verse 16, um, well, verse, verse 15, so I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens and officers among your tribes. And verse 16, and I charged your judges at that time, saying, hear the causes between your brethren, judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it to me, and I will hear it. Then Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, begins a portion of relevant scriptures. Um, well, verse 14, where, when thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, and shall possess, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, as like as all the nations that are about me. So God is saying, at, at the time when you as a people decide to put somebody in power over you, to rule over you, verse 15, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply uh, horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall not henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest and the Levites. And we, we, we referred to this back in the last two summers as we were talking about the book of Proverbs, how that Solomon very likely did this. And this is why so much of the Deuteronomy and such is just embodied in shorter form and succinct terse manner in the Proverbs. In verse 19, and it shall be with him, the, the law of God shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, 
to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, I don't have the time to develop it, but what you would notice, or what you might notice now that I mention it, is that Israel really had more of a republican form of government than a monarchy. If you look at each time when the kings were, uh, you know, Solomon didn't just become king. David didn't just become king. In fact, we read about that this morning. The people came and made David their king. The people made Saul their king. When Solomon came along, the the people made Solomon their king. When Rehoboam came along, the people said, no, we don't want you to be our king. Okay, so there was not just the way we think of a monarchy is not how Israel's government was. They were a king, but they were responsible to the people. Maybe there was one vote, and then you were the king forever. <laughs> but it was, there, was, there was voting going on, and so God is telling the people of Israel what to look for in a king, what to expect from them. Second Chronicles um, now we're jumping ahead. Second Chronicles 19, Jehoshaphat sets judges over the people. Second uh, Chronicles 19, verse 7. Uh, here we go. Second uh, Chronicles 19, verse 7. I think I have the wrong numbers. Verse 5, And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what you do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there's no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Moreover, in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and the priests, and uh, charged them, verse 9, that ye shall do in the fear of the Lord faithfully with a perfect heart. So this is many years later, Jehoshaphat sets these judges up and gives them instructions that are just like the instructions that God had given uh, earlier. And then Nehemiah, uh, here's kind of an example of a, of a ruler. Nehemiah, the Tershathah, was the governor of Israel. And um, Nehemiah 5, verse 15 well, verse 14, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even under the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bore rule over the people. But so did not I because of the fear of God. So, back to 2 Samuel, or... I'll come back there. You're probably still there. God says through David, he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. So he, he that rules over men must be just. Now I want us to just think of some verses that tell us about justice. Uh, Proverbs 28, verse 12. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Proverbs 28, 28, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. Proverbs 16, 12, it is abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. And we should remember when we read about kings in the Bible, that is just the, the current word for governors. And I don't mean only like the governor of Indiana. For anybody who's in government, whether it's the mayor, the governor, the president, the premier, the prime minister, uh, the sheriff, the, the district attorney, the, the, the prosecuting attorney, the king, all of those people are represented in the Bible by the word king and governors. So it is an abomination for government to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. Um, Proverbs 28, 15, as a roaring lion and a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Uh, the Bible teaches, um, if we took the list of things there that um, in those passages, we would see that God expects rulers to be wise and understanding, to be just, to fear God, to hate covetousness, to be humble, and to be honest. And all of those 
in various ways would kind of fit under the two headings of uh, being just and ruling in the fear of God. So um, one of the things that perverts justice is covetousness. When a man who rules will accept money from somebody to pervert justice. So that's, to me, I think hating covetousness is part of being just. And if we think of some verses that the Bible says about covetousness, Proverbs 29, 4, the king by judgment establishes the land, but he that receives gifts overthrows it. Proverbs 28, 16, the prince that wants understanding or lacks understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hates covetousness shall prolong his days. Luke 12, 15, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not of the abundance of the things which he, which he possesses. And Colossians 3, 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and nor infection, evil con concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So if a man is to be just, he, has to, he must rule according to the laws of the land and according to the laws of God, the law of God. Now, I think, anyway, he, he must rule according to the laws of the land. That would be justice, to rule according to the laws of the land. If a king, then, and if he's the king, or if he's the president, or whatever, it's his duty as the supreme ruler to make sure that everyone inferior to him also rules according to the laws of the land. I know in America we could think, well, that will never happen. I mean, the president doesn't have control over the mayor of this town, but he does have control over certain people. The governor does have control over certain people. The mayor has control over certain people. Anybody who is ruling and has people under him, it's his responsibility not only to rule according to the laws of land, but to make sure that his inferiors also. And a ruler, if he's just, must remember that he rules over men not animals, and I'm not saying that this is what almost every pastor who's looked at this passage in history said, because what happens, rulers get so high and mighty and they just think that they can move people around as if they're just um, property or they're, just, they're, they're what I do, and they don't think of them as the same as them. Rulers must remember that they rule over men and that they are only a man themselves and that they have rules, that they are under rules. It's interesting uh, last Sunday in, was, I don't, can't remember if it was Sunday morning or Sunday evening, Brother Ray mentioned the centurion. He says, I'm a man, what? Under authority. So he understood. He was a godly ruler. He understood that he was under authority, and he had people that did what he bid them. So uh, he that ruled over men must be just. That includes hating covetousness. It allow, it's um, ruling according to the laws of the land. Just means to allow the, his, his subjects or those that he rules their rights and their properties and also using the power of their office to right the injured against those that injured them or against the injurious. If rulers are going to be just, they're not going to allow wrong to be done in their, uh, under their authority. Then... David says, or God says, so a, um, he that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Now, we don't, we don't have time to go over that, but the, we, we learned about the fear of the Lord in um, the last two summers when we were talking through Proverbs, and we didn't scratch the surface of Proverbs, but I want us to read just a few verses. The fear of the Lord uh, has to do with being wise and understanding. It has, of course, to do with its, with its own term, being uh, living in the fear of the Lord. It has to do, if you live in the fear of the Lord, you'll be humble, uh, you'll be honest. But I want, So I want to read several verses that have to go with those four uh, characteristics. So uh, the fear of God. Um, what about this passage? Acts, where's my... Acts 12, 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now that was not an, an, Isra an Israelite king that God judged that way. That was Herod. Um, so um, he had no fear of God. 
and didn't give God the glory. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Ecclesiastes 8, 12, and 13 says, though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it will be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he fears not before God. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. A, a king, a, a ruler should be wise and understanding. Ecclesiastes 10, 16 and 17, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Proverbs 8, 14 and 15, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength by me. And that's, this is wisdom speaking. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. Proverbs 20, verse 26, a wise king scatters the wicked and brings the wheel over them. Proverbs 28, 16, the prince that wants, wanteth or lacks understanding is also a great oppressor. But he that hates covetousness shall prolong his days. Proverbs 29, 12, if a, if a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. Think about that. If, if anybody who rules, if, his advi if he will listen to lies, all of his advisors are wicked. Hmm, all his servants are wicked. Proverbs 31, 3, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. Rulers must be humble. Proverbs 20, verse 28, mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upheld by mercy. Proverbs 25, 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 14, 3, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Proverbs 15, 25, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Proverbs 16, 19. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Wherefore he says, God resists the, resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. And then finally, under the idea of the fear of the Lord, to be honest. Proverbs 17, 7. Excellent speech becomes not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. Proverbs 19, 9. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall perish. John 8, 44. Year of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, all these things come from the scriptures, but every single one of these traits and every single, every single thing that we've said about them are universally true. As I said, while we could say those apply to Israel, the truth of being wise and understanding, fearing God, being just, being honest, being humble, those truths are true regardless of whether you are uh, in the nation of Israel or not. So, David said, God said through David, he that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of the Lord. And I would say that uh, while we went quickly through these things, and I encourage you to think about them, look back at them, study them some, we should understand as Christians that anyone who rules over men should have these godly characteristics. Now, we see by the way Scripture talks about it that there are many people who rule over men who don't have these characteristics. The Bible describes the situation, describes the people who are real, ruled by, by those that don't have these characteristics. But if things are to be the way God wants them, anyone who rules over men should have these godly characteristics. They're universally true. And in the United States of America, we have the privilege to choose who will rule over us. So, what does that mean? As Bible believers, 
we should be choosing people who have these qualities. Now, I know right away people will, will have questions about that. And one of the questions is, are you saying that they must be Christians? I don't think that... Uh, I think to, to honestly keep all, be, have all these characteristics, you have to be a Christian. But I know myself, and I know a lot of Christians who don't always, every single day of their life, practice these characteristics. We're all sinners. And so in a certain sense, um, I, know, I, I believe someone can be a ruler who's not a Christian, who, to the best of his ability, tries to, to have these characteristics in their lives. In one sense... That's one of the benefits of growing up in a nation, not a Christian nation, but in a nation that has a Christian foundation. There are people who, you know, might not be saved in the way we as independent Baptists believe them, but they've been trained with a biblical background and understanding, and they, in their life, in their life, and especially in their government, believe that they should be wise and understanding, believe that they should be humble, they are humble, that they are honest, that they are just, that they hate covetousness. Those characteristics are ones we should look for and those that we vote for. We have the privilege to choose who will rule over us, and we should be choosing people who have these qualities. My belief is that we should only be choosing this type of a person. And I know there's arguments, there's responses to that, why we don't, there's the, there's the response of fear. If I vote for somebody who meets those things, I'm, I, I, I'm, af I'm afraid that if I vote for somebody who has those characteristics, some very evil person is actually going to win the election. Um, or there's the pragmatic view, and there's probably other views. I will admit, I'm coloring the, the, the issue. But to me, as we look at who we vote for, we should not be voting out of fear or pragmatism. We should be looking at these people. Do they, in the best of our understanding of them, do they, are they, will they be this type of person in office? Will they, do they do things that, are they sinners? Sure, I mean, I've heard stories about uh, Thomas Jefferson and Baptist pastors supporting him. He was not a, um, an absolutely moral man. We can talk about that. But if you look at his writings, he, he eschewed covetousness. He was honest. He was humble. Uh, all, you know, he, looked, he was wise. He didn't just go on his own thoughts. So here's somebody. I think I wouldn't have a problem voting for Thomas Jefferson because he had these characteristics, even though I probably, we, we, of course now nobody knows, but I might not think he was a saved man. Um, but, we, so, so when, while the lesson is about what should rulers be like, in America we get to choose our rulers. And so, at, because God gives us that privilege, we should be choosing people, we should be casting our choice for people who have these characteristics, people who are honest and humble and fear God and are wise and understanding and, and hate covetousness and um, are just. We should not change our vote because we're afraid of something happening. We should not vote for someone in particular who doesn't meet these qualifications just for pragmatic reasons. Um, there's many other things that go into choosing uh, the candidate that you vote for, but here today we've seen several things that should influence our decision, and I'm afraid that many Christians in the world today don't look at any of these. They only look at pragmatic reasons. They only look at, um, actually, they look at voting for covetous reasons. They, they like, who's going to help me the most? And our government is not out to help us. Our government's job is to protect us from evil and, and just let, anyway. Um, anyone who thinks that the Bible doesn't talk about government hasn't read or understood much of the Bible, and we could go for a long time, but it's time to stop so that you all, and we will stop, so that you all can get in your car and make your way over here, uh, turn, the, turn the oven on so that when you come home, your Easter dinner is ready. 
But um, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get ready for our morning service.